This week we're going to be looking at circumstances in which a person has made a promise in the form of a legally binding covenant to settle property which they expect to acquire in the future for another person on trust. At the heart of this is a central contradiction which we're going to explore straight away, so let's get into it now. The contradiction comes down to something that we have previously discussed in relation to the formalities of trusts, and this is that you cannot actually create a trust over property you don't yet have a right to, or don't have a proprietary interest in. However, on the other side of the coin in this situation I outlined in the introduction, a deed of covenant is more than just a word promise, it has the same legal effect as a binding contract, and has done so since the case of Hall and Palmer in 1844. So how can we resolve this contradiction? Well, let's have a look at the idea of a covenant in more detail, and this should give us some places where we can go. So we could potentially regard the covenant itself as property, and this has been done before. So again, in 1844, there was another case of Fletcher and Fletcher, and this is how the situation was resolved there. However, I think we have to be very careful about applying this in today's scenario, because the wording has to be very specific as to create a prop proprietary interest in the covenant. Moving on, and parties to a covenant can sue under the law of contract. Remember, the covenant does have that same legally binding force as a contract does, but they can't sue as beneficiaries under a trust. And so we see a distinction here between contract law on the one hand and equity and trusts law on the other. It is possible to get a, the contractual remedy of specific performance, but this is only available to those who have given consideration and this was seen in the case of Pullen and Co from 1913. We can also look at another case that I've not put on here called Cannon and Hartley. I think that's from about 1949. In that situation, there wasn't consideration and so specific performance was not available, but the claimant was able to claim damages in those circumstances. The law has changed relatively recently, at least in my lifetime, through the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act 1999. Before this point, the idea was that a contract um, was subject to privity of contract. In other words, if, you, if person A had a contract with person B, then it was only A who could sue B or B who could sue A. There was no outside influence and no other person could sue on that contract between those two people. The 1999 Act splits this wide open and deals with contracts that are specifically made for the benefit of a third party. And those third parties now have all of the same rights under contract law. So back to the example, if we imagine a contract between A and B, but that contract existed for the benefit of C, but person C could now sue under that contract even though they were not necessarily a signatory to it, it was made for their benefit, and that's why they can sue. So one final comment to make before we finish is in relation to forcing a trust, and a trustee cannot force the settler to establish a trust when they do actually receive the property. And this makes a lot of sense in many ways. The reason I've put trustee there in inverted commas is because, as we said right at the start, there isn't really a trust in place when the person expects to receive the property in the future because there's no proprietary interest that is actually established. And so we cannot force a settler to do so because if there's not a trust, then that essentially just reverts back to a resulting trust and the property would just go back to the settler anyway. And within the legal circles, that's just called vexatious litigation. It's essentially pointless to sue. I'd like to dedicate this video to friend of the channel Enoch, who was asking me this week about the remedy of specific performance in contract law, and particularly its relationship with the subject matter of equity and trusts. We've seen in this lecture that specific performance is available where a beneficiary has given consideration. But as an alternative to this, we can still see that the trust will work and can be enforceable, 
where the trust has been declared over the benefit of the covenant itself, as seen in the case of Fletcher and Fletcher from 1844. Well, I hope you found this short lecture very useful. If you did, make sure to leave it a like and subscribe for more videos in the future. If you have any questions about this, then leave them in the comments below and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.